but in the case of ios cat it's like it it literally has last exception and there's a comment that says this is here for the test to work and i'm like yeah you're supposed to test if things work correctly what the heck are you testing here <laughs> so any other crap to ramble about testing yeah <laughs> okay, hey I I was... we just did well i'd love to hear um your perspective on that and if you disagree about anything uh, feel free to uh Jump well, in. I partly agree and I partly disagree. I will talk both about the sad reality. I will talk about Utopia and I will talk about Rationale and I will plug for Coding in Flow who was working on a testing course. I don't know if he ever finished, but, <laughs> but uh, the important thing here, there are two things to keep in mind. One of them is that I personally don't like unit testing UI because when you want to unit test UI, it would end up with like RoboElectric and you're talking to Mox and I'm like, can I even trust that this thing works? So at that point you drag out the uh, logic if you want to unit test it anyway, uh, and then you would write tests against that. But then can I trust that, the, uh, that this shows correctly? So in the end, UI typically ends up being tested manually. It stops uh, being, um, it stops to scale manually testing a screen over time though, but I've only seen very major projects end up with like actual Espresso UI tests being written for them. Usually it's like, hey, we could write them and it's like, it never happens. <laughs> so that's partly the reason, like some people use Espresso, but it's like arcane knowledge, like the, the big companies that do use it, they don't tell you what they're doing. I'm pretty sure that Facebook has this screenshot testing framework for a reason, but who knows if they use it and not just they wrote it in their free time. But uh, let me talk about Utopia because that's what important. Simple stack. Do you think, you think I'm talking about something irrelevant, but no, in simple stack, Anything that's like related to the retained fragment is 0% code coverage in unit test, but everything that's like not Android related at all is one, well, it's 98% or something, which is pretty good, I think. So it's heavily tested. And how can you do this? Well, you didn't touch Android. You didn't touch external resources. You don't touch anything that's like, uh, um, that changes over time. I barely, I only had to like write fake implementations for the test, which would be valid as actual code in production, right? So uh, what I end up doing there is that I write code as if I was using the library and assert the behavior of the library, right? Using the public APIs, I literally don't have any code to any private or internal or package private functions in the tests because I, what I want to know is that if it works, through the public API, does it behave as expected? And this is something that I think many people don't do. I'm pretty sure that Google especially doesn't do. Like you wanna make minimal modifications to the public API in order to be able to test things, right? But on the other hand, you see something like Google's, what's it called? IO scheduler app. I think that's the one IO scheduler. And they have this thing, they store a private variable called previous exception, and it has visible for testing. And that's how they assert that the, the catch uh, part of the code was called. It's like, this is the opposite of what you're supposed to do. You're not supposed to be modifying the production code to be able to assert effects of it. Like that's so <laughs> weird. Like there's a trade-off of course. <laughs> There's a trade-off, like you add an interface to be able to make a fake implementation when you need it over something like a random, for example, because random is random, so you cannot guarantee that it returns the same thing. So you may have a fake or a mock of it. But in the case of iOS CAD, it's like, it, it literally has last exception. And there's a comment that says, this is here for the test to work. And I'm like, yeah. You're supposed to test if things work correctly. What the heck are you testing here? <laughs> yeah. I just wanted to, unless you, do you have more or? Well, sorry, no, I don't want to interrupt I, your flow. I so give her. Okay. No, I interrupted my own thoughts, so it's okay. 
Okay, I just want to... Here's an important thing for people to understand. Like, what are you actually doing when you're testing? This is a... Whenever I write articles or, or introduce in a long form this idea of testing, I always start with this because it's an important and relevant story. So in um, civil en or engineering of like physical stuff, so we're going to take the example of uh, building rockets. If I understand correctly, I'm not an engineer. Hopefully I get this jargon term right, but they have this concept of redundancy. So if I understand it correctly, if I get the term right, but I understand the concept. In redundancy, let's say you wanted to test a rocket how do you test a rocket? So this is a rocket that is going to fire into space and it's going to be, say, for example, a rocket thruster for a space shuttle. So people are going to die if this thing doesn't work, quite likely. So how do you test this thing? There's a number of ways to do it. So at the level of like, we'll call it unit testing, you want to take out the individual, every individual little piece of the rocket and you want to test each individual piece in different situations. Uh, and then you might have like what's called, I don't know, I'm not great with these jargon terms, but like integration testing. So testing a number of pieces, like maybe one part of the rocket, one particular thruster, maybe it has a couple thrusters. You test like a whole thruster together and see if that's working properly. And then you can test like progressively larger and larger parts of, of the rocket. Um, so that's kind of like one way to sort of visualize testing. Now, why is it important? Uh, some of you should be familiar with the Challenger shuttle disaster. Uh, I don't remember the date where this occurred, but basically um, there was a, uh, a rocket ex uh, shuttle expedition, the Challenger disaster, and a rocket ship, which had on a number of people, including like a teacher and stuff like that, fired off into the air and then suddenly veered off course and then eventually exploded. And I'm not making light of that. That sucks. People die. Why did this happen? Well, there's there's a political, there's a broader political implementation there, which is that the administration wasn't listening to the engineers. But specifically what happened is that one single component in these rockets, which were called O-rings, it's like a gasket, they were made of rubber. And these O-rings, well, what happens to rubber, what happens to a rubber band if you put it in a freezer? It becomes hard and, and brittle. Same thing with these O-rings. So what happened was when they were launching the rocket, it happened to be a particularly cold morning. I think it was around zero degrees or something like that. And so what happened is when the rockets fired, the, uh, the O-rings, which were supposed to stop fuel, rocket fuel, from leaking into one uh, compartment of the rockets into another, ceased to function properly. And then it caused a catastrophic failure. So... The idea here, the reason why I talk about this analogy is it's just like writing your code. It can fail in individual pieces. It can fail in different parts integrating with each other. And you should try to always test the whole thing at one point or another. And then at each step, say if we're testing the O-ring, you want to potentially run multiple tests. What does it do at this temperature? What does it do at this temperature? What does it do at this temperature? So that's kind of, a, I think, a useful analogy for testing in code is we create copies of the thing that we want to test. So a copy of the real thing, hence redundancy. And then we test it in a controlled environment, usually, yeah, hopefully. And then we see how it behaves. And that's how testing essentially, it's exactly the same process with coding. Um, and that, so I find that useful to explain to people because um, sometimes it's difficult to think in coding or to understand what you're actually doing. And by look, thinking of an analogy which is quite physical, uh, I find that to be a useful way of thinking about uh, testing your code. Similar idea there. That was actually really, really insightful. I will jump in with one particular thing, just one, which is that uh, uh, there's one important thing here, which is that each component had to be tested independently as units, right? That's practically the premise here. And to make that happen in code, you need to ensure that components are a thing that exists. 
And a common misconception is thinking that each class is an independent component, but it's really not. <laughs> it's uh, way better to think of it like if you were writing a library like, like Retrofit and it has a public API, and when you want a unit test, you want to use that public API of that independent component, which isn't just one class, it's multiple classes. And honestly, if this component has multiple classes as the public API, then it could get trickier and trickier and trickier to know just which part of it you really want to test other than all of them. And that's why it's, it gets tricky when you have something like a use case, a repository, a DAO, a view model, or what. What, where is the end of this? What's the component here, right? And when you notice that it's really the view model that you're actually using, the use case itself is something that you could be uh, talking to as an independent component, but everything else that it uses, it's like nobody cares about it. The question to ask there is whether you should test the view model or the use case or both. And I guess you can go both. Uh, I don't have advice on repository testing because, well, I don't really like repositories in general. I think they should just be use cases. <laughs> so, but yeah, the important thing here was that they need to be components to be tested as components and classes alone. That doesn't mean that it's a component because you have all these collaborators. Eventually, all of them technically belong to your components behavior. So you transitively need to test everything, but you want to really test through the public API of the component. Just pretend you're writing retrofit each time and you will have good unit tests. <laughs> <laughs> nice. So yeah, that's a, a bunch of stuff about testing. And um, I just one final point on that. I don't personally uh, do 100% code coverage. You'll hear people talk about that. I don't know, Gabor, have you ever seen anyone actually do that in a big project? Big project, hell no. They are usually like, hey, we have 80% and I'm like, what kind of unit tests are they? And what you end up seeing is that they have a metric saying that the requirement for accepting this code base is to have an 80% code coverage. So you know what kind of tests you end up seeing? That, oh, this is this is the dystopia edition. Okay, let's go with that. Like I was talking about Utopia, this is the dystopia, okay? So they're like, okay, now we need 80% code coverage. So what they end up doing is that they grab every class as it is and they pass same mocks and they basically say, okay, this returns true so that this if condition runs and after the end, they assert whatever is there. Like you don't know what the code was supposed to do, but they are definitely setting up the mock so that the code path executes and the mock will return the right results. So the code coverage is boosted, but behavior is never asserted, not through the public API, but by knowing exactly what is invoked where. So if you changed anything in the implementation, then it would break the tests, even if the actual behavior, the new behavior is correct, because it's relying on implementation details. The whole thing is just, configuring mocks to run exactly what you see there in the code. So this is what people talk about when they say that TDD makes your code brittle. No, what made it brittle is that they hard coded the behavior, the actual behavior of the class inside the test, instead of just asserting what it should have done, like what the end result should be. They actually coded the current behavior and now it's not changeable. You cannot change it without actually deleting the test. And that's what it typically ends up with. They're like, well, I need to change this code here because um, it's updated. We realized that model view presenter is no longer working for us, whatever. You would get the exact same results or even better results, but you are deleting stuff. Like you are changing things that the test rely on. So they're like, okay, this test is broken. What do I do with it? I don't know, this was written by two years ago, nobody cares, just delete it and that's it. And that's how code coverage is made and that's the unit tests you often see. People just setting up books, hoping for the best and not actually testing what's the expected behavior. It's more like just make the code run at least once through this path so that management will believe that the code coverage metrics are met. Yeah, this is dystopia, but it's real. <laughs> Well, what we just, if I understand this correctly, what we've learned from uh, Google's example is that um, if, uh, 
if your tests are failing, change the production codes so that the tests pass, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. That's correct. Awesome. Got it. IO sked. Does it doesn't matter if the test was correct, doesn't matter if the production code was correct. Just change it. Just make it seem like it works. Okay. Hey. Nobody will <laughs> Yeah, we hey, we got to hit 80% code coverage. Let's go, people. Um, I guess while we're on this topic, one more um one more thing here. Uh, uh Vlad asks, um, what about code that retrieves information from the Android framework? Uh, if I will mock it, uh, I will never get any real error. And I probably trust Gabor's opinions on this a lot more, but this is the kind of thing where I don't really feel comfortable writing like a unit test. To me, that's more in the realm of testing. Uh, like, I don't know the testing terms because I'm a plebeian here, but like instrumentation testing uh, and seeing how it behaves with the actual Android framework uh, and if you can set it up for situations like that, but that can require some difficulty. Yeah. Unfortunately, it can be flaky, but that's how it would normally go. Like what you actually encode in an instrumentation test is if you tapped this button and then this button and then this button, so it automates your manual testing behavior. And I think that's actually pretty clean if you think about it. Like the app does exactly what you would do as the developer or as the QA or whatever, step by step. They go through the buttons. And that's also why it's brittle in a way over time because, well, they're like, well, we want to move this button over here. We want to replace it with a checkbox. I don't like if the design changes a lot, then the UI test will also break because, well, you have a different UI now, right? But in a way that makes sense because, well, you are now doing different things. So, <laughs> but yeah, UI tests in theory are pretty cool. It's just that I think Espresso's API just wasn't very good. and. And most people didn't really uh, try to wrap it up with something that's more workable. But there's Barista. Like, I have not used Barista, but I looked at Barista. And for example, that's supposedly someone's pet project. They've been working on it for three years now to like wrap Espresso with Kotlin in such a way that you can actually like, like instead of saying something like, on view, whatever matcher, perform view interactions, blah, blah, blah. And then you realize that in order to like type into a second thing, you first have to hide the keyboard manually. Like you can't just say type into this and type into that because then it will break eh, espresso things. So Barista instead handles all of that. It handles recycler you scrolling. It handles waiting for the recycler you to scroll down. All that stuff. They did a whole load of things. So. Mm -hmm. If someone was to try to do UI testing, I would actually go for a barista, look at it, just what it does, and maybe even use it and not just directly go with Espresso. Interesting. 